This is very new in the sense I've never read it before, and I wrote it in 1999, and it was part of what would be, and it became an outtake from my long novel, which is called Blonde. The, it's a kind of postmodernist, fictionalized autobiography of Marilyn Monroe, or rather Norma Jean Baker, who becomes Marilyn Mon Monroe. So I was in a kind of trance, and I was working on this for months and months, deeply immersed in the very, very interesting and fascinating and, and in some ways um, tragic life of Norma Jean Baker, who becomes Marilyn Monroe, and is sort of suffocated by being Marilyn Monroe. This is a chapter that I took out of the novel. I got to a point where I could have been writing the novel forever. I was so entranced by the phenomenon of Marilyn Monroe as she intersected with people who are not uh, otherwise involved in the novel. Sort of, and I don't want to say anonymous people, but sort of you know, real life people like any of us. So it just became very, very fascinating to me. What were the intersection of of uh, this iconic, quote unquote, and that's become a cliche now, but actually the word, that I can't think of any other word quite so appropriate. What sort of effect does it have upon people who are not celebrities and not greatly talented to have come into contact with somebody who is truly iconic, especially as the years go by and they remember this intersection, which meant perhaps nothing to, to, in this case, Marilyn Monroe, but meant everything to these other people. So it's actually um, a kind of memoirist piece. A woman is remembering how she was deeply in love. She was a young girl at the time. NYU girl poet, undergraduate. She was in love with another girl, very much like herself, and we, in, we infer from what she tells us that it's actually years later now, and their lives are very different, but this is this sort of magical moment of intersection. Three girls. In Strand used books on Broadway and 12th, one snowy March early evening in 1956, when the street lights on Broadway glimmered with a strange sepia glow, we were two NYU girl poets drifting through the warehouse of treasures as through an enchanted forest. Just past 6 p.m., above light riddled Manhattan, opaque night, snowing and sidewalks encrusted with ice, so there were fewer customers in the strand than usual at this hour, but there we were. Among other cranky brooding regulars, in our army surplus jackets, baggy khaki pants, and zip-up rubber boots, and our matching wool nap caps, knitted by your restless fingers, pulled down low over our pale girl foreheads, enchanted by books, enchanted by the Strand. No bookstore of merely new books with elegant show window displays drew us like the drafty Strand. Bins of books untidy and thumb through as merchant sidewalks bins on 14th Street. New this week, best bargains, world classics, art books, 50% off, reviewer's copies, highest price, $1.98, remainders, 25 cents to $1. Hardcover, paperback, spotless, battered, beautiful books, cheaply printed pulp paper. And at the rear and sides, in that vast echoing space, massive shelves of books, books, books rising to a ceiling of hammered tin, 15 feet above, stacked shelves so high they required ladders to negotiate and the monkey nimbleness like yours to climb. We were enchanted with the strand with each other in the strand, overseen by surly young clerks who were poets like us or playwrights or actors or artists. In an agony of unspoken young love, I watched you. As always on these romantic evenings at the strand, prowling the aisles, sneering at those luckless books, so many of them unworthy of your attention, bestsellers, how-to, arts and crafts, two simple histories of women's romances, sentimental love poems, patriotic books, middle-brow books, books lacking esoteric covers. 
We were girl poets passionately enamored of T.S. Eliot, but scornful of Robert Frost, who we'd been made to memorize in high school. Slyly, we communicated in code phrases from Eliot in the presence of obtuse others in our dining hall. We were admiring us, we, uh, we were admiring, as we were admiring, though confused by the poetry of Yeats. We were yet more confused by the lauded worth of Pound, enthusiastically drawn to the bold metaphors of Kafka, that cockroach, and Dostoevsky, sexy murder as Kolnikov and the underground man were our rebel heroes, and Sartre, hell is other people. We knew this and had reason to believe that we were their in lineage, though admittedly we were American middle class and Caucasian and female. Yet we were not conventional females. In fact, we shared male contempt for the merely conventional female. Rooting above a tumble of books that quickened the pulse, almost shyly touching Freud's civilization and its discontents, Crane Brinton's The Age of Reason, Margaret Mead's Coming of Age in Samoa, D.H. Lawrence's The Rainbow, Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling, Mann's Death in Venice. There suddenly you glided up behind me to touch my wrist, as you never you'd done before, had you? And whispered, come here. In a way that thrilled me for its meaning, I have something wonderful, unexpected, startling to show you. Like poems these discoveries in the Strand were to us, poems to be cherished, and eagerly I turned to follow you, though disguising my eagerness. Yes, what? As if you'd interrupted me, for possibly we'd had a quarrel earlier that day, a flaring of, of tense girl tempers. Yes, you were childish and self-absorbed and given to sulky silences and mercurial moods in the presence of showy, superficial people. And I adored and feared you knowing you'd break my heart my heart that had never before been broken, because never so exposed. So eagerly, yet with my customary guardedness, I followed you through a maze of book bins and shelves and stacks to the ceiling, anthropology, art, ancient, art, renaissance, art, modern, art, Asian, art, western, travel, philosophy, cookery, poetry, modern, where the way was treacherously lighted by bare 60-watt bulbs, and where custom customers as cranky as we two stood in the aisles reading books, or sat hunched on footstools, glancing up annoyed at us. And unquestioning, I followed you until at Poetry Modern, you halted and pushed me ahead and around a corner, and I stood puzzled, staring, not knowing what I was supposed to be seeing, until impatiently you poked me in the ribs and pointed. And now, I perceived an individual in the aisle, pulling down books from shelves and peering at them, clearly absorbed by what she read, a woman nearly my height. I was tall for a girl in 1956, and a man's navy coat to her ankles and with sleeves past her wrists, a man's beige fedora on her head, scrunched low as we wore our knitted caps, and most of her hair hidden by the hat except for a six-inch blonde plate at the nape of her neck. And she wore black trousers tucked into what appeared to be salt-stained cowboy boots. Someone we knew, an older, good-looking student from one of our classes, a girl poet like ourselves. I was about to nudge you in the ribs in bafflement when the blonde woman turned, taking down another book from the shelf, E.E. E. Cummings's Tulips and Chimneys. Always I remember that title. And I saw this was Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe in the Strand, just like us, and she seemed to be alone. Marilyn Monroe, alone, wholly absorbed in a browsing mid-book, so oblivious of her surroundings and of us. No one seemed to have recognized her yet, except you. It was a surprise. The woman was not really Marilyn Monroe. For this woman was an individual wholly absorbed in selecting, leafing through, and pausing to read books. You could see that this individual was a reader, one of those who reads, with concentration, with passion, with her very soul, and it was poetry she was reading, her lips pursed, silently shaping words. Absent-mindedly, she wiped her nose on the edge of her hand, so intent was she on what she was reading. For when you are reading poetry, truly, poetry reads you. Still, this woman was Marilyn Monroe, and despite our common sense, our scorn for the silly cliches of Hollywood romance, still we halfway expected a leading man to join her, Clark Gable, Robert Taylor, Marlon Brando. Halfway, we expected the syrupy surge of movie music, 
to glide us into the scene. But no man joined Marilyn Monroe in her disguise as one of us in the Strand. No leading man, no dark prince. Like us, we began to see, this Marilyn Monroe required no man. For what seemed like a long time, but was probably no more than half an hour, Marilyn Monroe browsed into poetry modern shelves as from a distance of approximately 10 feet, two girl poets watched covertly, clutching each other's hands. We were stunned to see that this woman looked very little like the glamorous Marilyn Monroe. That figure was a garish blonde showgirl, a Hollywood sex pot of no interest to intellectuals. We thought, who knew nothing of the secret romance between Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller at this time. This figure more resembled us almost than she resembled her Hollywood image. We were dying of curiosity to see whose poetry books Marilyn Monroe was examining. Elizabeth Bishop, H.D., Robert Lowell, Muriel Rukeyser, Harry Crosby, Dennis Levitaw. Five or six of these Marilyn Monroe decided to purchase, then moved on, leather bag slung over her, po her shoulder and fedora tilted down on her head. We couldn't resist, we had to follow. Cautious not to whisper together like excited schoolgirls, still less to giggle wildly as we were tempted, you nudged me in the ribs to sober me, gave me a glare signaling, don't be rude, don't ruin this for all of us. I conceded, I was the more pushy of the two of us, a tall, gawky Rima the bird girl, with springy, carroty red hair like an exotic bird's crest. While you were petite and dark head and attractive, with long lash Semitic slow eyes, you the wily gymnast and I the aggressive basketball player. You the experimental poet and I was drawn to forms. Our contrary talents bred into our bones. Which of us would marry, have babies, disappear into real life? And which of us would persevere into her 30s before starting to be published and becoming in time a real poet? Could anyone have predicted the snowy March evening in 1956? Marilyn Monroe drifted through the maze of books and we followed in her wake as through a maze of dreams, past sports, past military, past war, past the familiar figures of Strand regulars frowning into books, past surly yawning bearded clerks who took no more heed of the blonde actress than they ever did of us, and so to natural history where she paused and there again for unhurried minutes, the strand was open till 9 p.m. Marilyn Monroe, in her mannish disguise, browsed and brooded, pulling down books, seeking what? At last crouched, I leafing through an oversized illustrated book. Curiosity overcame me. I shoved away your restraining hand. Politely, I eased past Marilyn Monroe, murmuring, excuse me, without so much as brushing against her and without being noticed. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species in a deluxe edition. Darwin, Origin of Species. We were poet despisers of science, or believe we were, or must be, to be true poets in the exalted mode of T.S. Eliot and William Butler Yeats. Such a choice for Marilyn Monroe seemed perverse. But this book was one Marilyn decided quickly to purchase, hoisting it into her arms and moving on. That rakish fedora we'd come to cover and that single chunky blonde braid. Suddenly, Marilyn Monroe glanced back at us, frowning as a child might frown. Had we spoken aloud? Had she heard our thoughts? And there came into her look a face of puzzlement, not alarm or annoyance, but a childlike puzzlement. Who are you, you two? Are, are you watching me? Quickly we looked away. We were engaged in a whispering dispute over a book one of us had fumbled from a shelf. A history of botanical gardens in England. So we were undetected, we thought. <laughs> but wary now and sobered, for what if Marilyn Monroe had caught us and knew that we knew? She might have abandoned her books and fled. What a loss for her and for the books and for us too. Oh, we worried at Marilyn Monroe's recklessness. We dreaded her being recognized by a male customer or male clerk. A girl or woman would have kept her secret, we thought, but no man could resist staring openly at her, following her, and at last speaking to her. Of course, the blonde actress in Strand used books wasn't herself, not at all glamorous or sexy or especially blonde, in her inconspicuous man's clothing and those salt-stained boots. She might have been anyone, male, female or male, hardly a celebrity, celebrity or a movie goddess. 
Yet if you stared, you would recognize her. If you tried without any imagination, you'd see Meryl Monroe. It was a child's game in which you stare at foliage, grass, clouds in the sky, and suddenly you see a face or a figure, and after that recognition, you can't not see the hidden shape. It's staring you in the face. So too with Marilyn Monroe. Once we saw her, it seemed to us she must be seen and recognized by anyone, if any man saw. We were feared for her privacy would be destroyed. Quickly the blonde actress would become surrounded and mob. It was risky and reckless of her to have come to Strand Yu's book by herself, we thought. Sure, she could shop at Tiffany's, maybe. She could stroll through the lobby of the plaza or the Waldorf Astoria. She'd be safe from fans and unwanted admirers in privileged settings on the Upper East Side. But here, in the egalitarian Strand on Broadway and 12th, we were perplexed. Almost I was annoyed with her taking such chances, but you gripping my wrist had another more subtle thought. She thinks she's like us. You meant a human being, anonymous, female like us, amid the ordinary, unspectacular customers, predominantly male, of the Strand. And that was the sadness of it, Marilyn Monroe's wish, to be like us, for it was impossible, of course, for anyone could have told Marilyn Monroe, even two young girl poets, that it was too late for her in history. Already at age 30, we would calculate that, that later that it was her age, Marilyn Monroe had entered history and there was no escape. Her films, her photos, her face, her figure, her name. To enter history is to be abducted spiritually with no way back. As if lightning were to strike the building that houses the strand, as if an actual current of electricity were to touch and transform only one individual in the great cavern of space, and that lone individual, by pure chance it might seem, the caprice of fate would be the young woman with the blonde braid and the fedora slanted across her face. Why? Why her and not another? You could argue that such a destiny is absurd and undeserved for one individual among many, and logically you would be correct. And yet, Marilyn Monroe has entered history, and you have not. She will endure, though the young woman with the blonde braid will die. And even should she wish to die, Marilyn Monroe cannot. By this time, she, the young woman with the blonde braid, was carrying an armload of books. We were hoping she'd almost finished and would be leaving soon before strangers' rude eyes lightened upon her and exposed her. But no, she surprised us by heading for a section called Judicia. In that forbidding aisle, which we'd never before entered, there were books in numerous languages, Hebrew, Yiddish, German, Russian, French. Some of the books looked ancient, complete sets of the Talmud, critically printed tomes on the Kabbalah. Luckily for us, the titles Marilyn Monroe pulled out were all in English. Jews of Eastern Europe, The Chosen People, A Complete History of the Jews, Jews of the New World. Quickly, Marilyn Monroe placed her bag and books on the floor and sat on a footstool and leafed through pages with the frowning intensity of a young girl, as if searching for something urgent, something she knew must be there. In this uncomfortable posture, she remained for at least 15 minutes, wetting her fingers to turn pages that stuck together, pages that had not been turned or read for decades. She was frowning, yet smiling too. Faint vertical lines appeared between her eyebrows in the intensity of her concentration. Her eyes moved rapidly along lines of print, then returned and moved most slowly. By this time, we were close enough to observe the blonde actress's feverish cheeks and slightly parted moist lips that seemed to move silently. What is she reading in that ancient book? What can possibly mean so much to her? A secret reveal? A secret to save her life? Hey, you! A clerk called out in a nasal, insinuating voice. The three of us looked up startled. But the clerk wasn't speaking to us. Not to the blonde actress frowning over the chosen people, and not to us who were hovering close by. The clerk had caught someone slipping a book into an overcoat pocket. Not an unusual sight at the Strand. But after this mild upset, Marilyn Monroe became uneasy. She turned to look frankly at us, though we tried clumsily to retreat. Her eyes met us. She knows. But after a moment, she simply turned back to her book, stubborn and determined to finish what she was reading. While we continued to hover close by, exposed now and blushing, yet feeling protective of her. She has seen us, she knows, she trusts us. 
We saw that Marilyn Monroe was beautiful. In her anonymity, as she'd never seemed to us to be beautiful as Marilyn Monroe. All that, was, all that was makeup and fakery and cartoon sexiness, subtle as a kick in the groin. All that was vulgar and infantile. But this young woman was beautiful without makeup, without even lipstick, in her mannish clothes, her hair in a stubby braid. Beautiful, her skin luminous and pale, and her eyes a startling clear blue. Almost shyly, she glanced back at us to notice that we were still there, and she smiled. Yes, I see you too. Thank you for not speaking my name. Always you and I would remember that smile of gratitude and sweetness. Always you and I would remember that she trusted us as perhaps we would not have trusted ourselves. So many years later, I'm proud of us. We were so young. Young, headstrong, arrogant, insecure, though brilliant, or so we'd been led to believe. Not that we thought of ourselves as young. You were 19 and I was 20. We were mature for our ages and we were immature. We were intellectually sophisticated and emotionally unpredictable. We revered something we called art. We were disdainful of something we called life. We were overly conscious of ourselves, and yet how patient, how protective, watching over Marilyn Monroe, squatting on a footstool in the Jewish stacks as stray customers pushed past, muttering, excuse me, or not even seeming to notice her as the two of us stood guard. And at last, a relief. Marilyn Monroe shut the unwieldy book, having decided to buy it, and rose from the footstool, gathering up her many things. And this was a temptation. We held back, not offering to help her carry her things, as we badly wanted to do, but just following at a little distance behind her, as she made her way through the labyrinth of the bookstore to the front counter. Did she glance back at us? Did she understand that you and I were her protectors? If anyone dared to approach her, we intended to intervene. We would push between Marilyn Monroe and whomever it was. Yet how strange the scene was, none of the other Strand customers lost in books took any special notice of her any more than they took of us. Book lovers, especially used book lovers, were not ones to stare curiously at others, but only at books. At the front of the store, it was a long hike. The cashiers would be more alert, we thought. One of them seemed to be watching Marilyn Monroe approach. Did he know? Could he guess? Was he waiting for her? Nearing the front counter in the bright fluorescent lights overhead, Marilyn Monroe seemed for the first time to falter. She fumbled to extract out of her shoulder bag a pair of dark glasses and managed to put them on. She turned up the collar of her navy coat. She lowered her hat brim. Still she was hesitant, and it was then that I stepped forward and said quietly, excuse me, why don't I buy your books for you? That way you won't have to talk to anyone. The blonde actress stared at me through her oversized dark glasses. Her eyes were only just visible behind the lenses, a shy girl's eyes, startled and grateful. And so I did, with you helping me. Two girl poets side by side, all brisk and businesslike, making Marilyn Monroe's purchases for her. A total of 16 books, hardcover and paperback, relatively new books, old battered thumb through books, a cost of $55.85 a staggering sum. Never in my two years of coming into the Strand had I hand over more than a few dollars to the cashier, and this time my hand might have trembled as I pushed twenty dollar bills at him, half expecting the bristly bearded man to interrogate me. Where'd you get so much money? <laughs> but as years of the cash, har cashier hardly gave me a second glance, and Marilyn Monroe, burdened with no books, had already slipped through the turnstile and was awaiting us at the front door. There, when we handed over her purchases in two sturdy bags, she leaned forward. For a breathless moment, she th we thought she might kiss our cheeks. Instead, she pressed into our surprised hands a slender volume she lifted from one of her bags, selected poems of Marianne Moore. We stammered thanks, but already the blonde actress had pulled the fedora down more tightly over her head and had stepped out into the lightly falling snow headed south on Broadway. We trailed behind her, unable to resist, waiting for her to hail a taxi, but she did not. We knew we must not follow her. By this time, we were giddy with the strain of the past hour, gripping each other's hands in childlike elation, so happy. Oh, God, Marilyn Monroe, she gave us a book. Was any of this real? It was real. We had selected poems of, Marilyn, of Marianne Moore to prove it. 
That snowy early evening in March at Strand News Books, that magical evening of Marilyn Monroe when I kissed you for the first time. Thank you, Joyce. And that story, Three Girls, has served as an inspiration for two talented musicians, and you're about to hear the results. First up is Ben Arthur. He's a singer, songwriter, and novelist whose latest album, Call and Response, is a collection of answer songs inspired by artists like the Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, Alice Monroe, and of course, Joyce Carol Oates. He's also collaborated with Jonathan Lethem and uh, George Saunders, and he has shared the stage with Dave Matthews, Tori Amos, Bruce Hornsby, and Toots and the Maytels. And he'll be playing a song that he wrote in response to three girls, and then one more for good measure. So please welcome Ben Arthur to the Green Space stage. So, oh, that's just nice. Uh, so, uh, this new record I'm doing, or I'm, I'm going to release in, in the fall, is all answer songs, as Mr. Lopate was saying. And um, this one is a response to uh, the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil, um, which I thought was an interesting song to answer. Um, <laughs> anyway, here it is. Opposite of joy isn't anger, and the other side of peace is restlessness. Though I'm often tempted to abandon you, I can't leave you in this mess. You call me the prince of deception. You're the one who's closing your eyes Wish I knew if he still lies to you Or if these stories are just in your mind This is the farthest thing from heaven Look around, you'll see it's true This is the farthest thing from heaven We're a lot alike, me and you We're a lot alike, me and you You are so like our Creator Still there must be days when you can tell Yes, it's true, I still walk among you Here on the bright streets of hell This is the farthest thing from heaven Look around, you'll see it's true This is the farthest thing from heaven Away, babe. 
bitterness And some days I wonder If the joys of heaven Don't depend A little on us This is the farthest thing from heaven Look around, you'll see it's true This is the farthest thing from heaven We're a lot alike, me and you We're a lot alike, me and you